everyone. My name is Rene LaBelle. I'm your uh, host tonight. We're going to be doing something a little bit different on this uh, third Tuesday of the odd month of the Applied Project Manager Speaker Forum. I'll turn off these uh, slides here in a second. We're not going to be using the slide projector tonight. Uh, first thing I want to know, is there anyone here for the very first time? Welcome. Usually we have lots of newcomers, but uh, thank you very much for joining us. Just to go over tonight, we are not going to be using slides, and it's basically going to be an interactive uh, panel discussion on blockchain. Um, there is only one rule. Well, actually, I'm going to make two rules because it sounds better. We are not going to talk about cryptocurrencies tonight at all, so please no questions on anything to do with cryptocurrencies. And we just want to talk about blockchain and all the wonderful things that it's possible to, to do with blockchain. Um, the second rule is that when you ask a question, please make sure that you got a mic. It's really important for the video recording. Um, many people have voices that carry throughout the room, but the camera without a mic will not, it would not appear on the video recording. So I would just like to do now a very brief introduction. I wanted to thank our, our two panel members, Ven and Jean Cédric and uh, Jana for putting together a, a great panel. Unfortunately, one, our third panelist will be here in a few minutes, but we've decided to go ahead and start, uh, even though uh, she's not here. So please welcome our great group. And I'll turn this over to Jana. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rene. Welcome here today at the Jindal School of Management, and uh, I thank the panelists being here as well. We probably all heard about the blockchain being referred to as a, the disruptive technology, the Internet 2.0, or the fourth industrial revolution, right? We learned about the assumed benefits of immutability and the decentralization, transparency and trust and automation that blockchain provides. The big crypto hype of 2017 brought Bitcoin and blockchain into the covers of magazines and news headlines. So it would, be, would have been difficult to miss all of that hype. Since 2017, however, crypto hype has faded and currency values have dropped to the levels where the prices don't hit the news anymore. While the crypto hype has uh, faded a little, companies are slowly and surely moving along with utilizing blockchain technology in resolving their problems. However, we are still in a very early stages of blockchain adoption. A recent Gartner annual CIO survey for 2019 to almost 3,000 CIOs states that only 3.3% of respondents have deployed a blockchain solution to production, which is up from 1% last year. So we are truly uh, in the early stages. And only about 8% are expecting to deploy a, a solution into production within the next 12 months. Today, we have a great local expert panel here to discuss the actual and the real life applications of blockchain within companies. And uh, uh, to hear where these experts see the use of blockchain technology going in the future. We have here in Dallas a great community of, uh, of blockchain experts and blockchain companies. And these two fine gentlemen here represent two of them. So we have JC from Finastra and Ven from uh, IBM. And um, uh, the third panelist is uh, Farhin Ali, and she will be joining a, a little bit later. But I will start with uh, uh, getting for all of us to get to know our panelists a little better. And um, starting with JC, uh, can you tell a little bit about yourself and uh, uh, the company that you work for and what do you do around blockchain? Sure. So my name is uh, JC Joland. And uh, the reason why I'm here today is because uh, as a former New Yorker, when I'm given free parking, I, I just can't say no. <laughs> Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, 
No, the reason why I'm here today is because I work at Finastra, where we have a few projects actually implementing blockchain with actual customers in production. So we don't just talk about it, we actually implement that in production. And my role is a director of development, so I oversee everything around implementation and operations. Um, and our company, Finastra, is a financial software company and we have about 9,000 customers around the world uh, that are typically any type of banks, from the large banks, everybody knows, to the smaller banks. So our use of blockchain to some extent is, is uh, quite influential in the sense that we can reach an extensive population of, of financial institutions, and that's probably the reason why I'm here today. But parking was cool, thanks. Okay, my name is Ven Kumar, I work with IBM. I'm currently the CTO for IBM at PepsiCo. And prior to that, as I was on the CTO for the Walmart account for the past four, four and a half years. And most of my blockchain work has been primarily at Walmart. Uh, you probably have seen all the press for the food safety provenance blockchains. I was involved in it right from the beginning all the way to taking them into production. And uh, we did a couple of other pilots before the food safety one. We can talk about, you know, use of blockchain in supply chain and how that was being used at Walmart. And we are trying a few different stuff here at PepsiCo, things like, you know, using something called Know Your Supplier as one of the blockchain we're looking at. And of course, there are a lot of other IBM work in the blockchain space, specifically in the healthcare market for, you know, storing your health records and all that. So. Uh, glad to be here, and uh, hopefully we'll have a good discussion with JC and team. Mm -hmm. Great. So we all have a, our first time with blockchain. We, uh, we share an interesting story. So if, if you go out there and talk to anyone who's in blockchain and ask them about their uh, time that they got introduced uh, to blockchain, uh, those stories are very interesting. So. And uh, I want to hear, and the audience to hear as well, that uh, uh, how did you all get uh, introduced to blockchain for the first time, and, and how did you get involved? Sure. Um, my involvement uh, with blockchain started, uh, even though I did the food safety project, there was a couple of research work that was going on at Walmart, uh, at uh, IBM Research, and that was more to do around IoT, nothing to do with blockchain. But there was a paper published at IBM Research, and it was called Device Democracy. And the whole idea around device democracy at that time was, you know, it, IoT was big. Uh, it's much bigger now. But the challenge is, you know, if you start bringing more and more of these IoT devices into homes, nobody was thinking in terms of, you know, these devices are just coming in and people do not think that after a year, year and a half, they are going to be obsolete, you need to throw it away. So the question is, how do I now start looking at it from a device perspective that any device that a consumer buys at their house can be easily connected to your network, get it secure, and I can identify that this is a secure device connecting to my home network. So how do you do that in an easy way without having to remember passwords, user IDs, and all that stuff, right? I mean, because anybody who has bought in a new Wi-Fi enabled device probably doesn't change their default passwords. So that's one you know, security hole that's there in the system. So there was a paper interestingly written which talked about use of blockchain for something called device democracy where you can use something like a blockchain to manage the whole life cycle of a device, authenticate it, guarantee that it's safe to join your home network. And I started looking at it more and more and and that's when you know the initial blockchain conversations are all in finance. So when we started talking about IoT and uh, other aspects at Walmart, that's when the conversation switched to, hey, you know, there's a huge market from a supply chain perspective, and this could be the right, you know, technology to look at. So that's kind of the genesis of our conversations at block with Walmart around supply chain and food safety. Thanks. So my journey with blockchain starts about two years ago, uh, late 2016, uh, early 2017, where we were starting a new project where we had to connect banks together in a way where we would not see the information. The, the financial industry today, for the most part, is using um, a hub-and-spoke model where you have a central server 
which is very easy to implement. Uh, it's been used for, for years where they basically connect to a central server, so they only have to configure one outbound connection to a central service where they can reach all their peers. And this is obviously raising a few concerns that if that central point gets hacked or if it fails, the entire network uh, falls apart. And the other problem we have is that um, if for whatever reason the, the, the vendor that's operating that central server is, uh, wants to look at the data, even if it's encrypted, they would be able to see what's going on. They basically have a say, not a say, but they, they can see every single packet that's going through the network. So it's both a source of failure and a problem of, of privacy. So we were looking for something that would be peer-to-peer -peer and would allow banks to achieve some form of a consensus where uh, what they see would essentially be what their peers see. So they know together at the same time that they have a synchronized uh, record where they can book a transaction without having to go to a central server. And, and this is basically what, what, what blockchain is about. I mean, there's a few other things, of course. Uh, Yana briefly touched on immutability. But um, we, we looked at the technologies available at the time, and nothing was really mature. Nothing was really there. But uh, this idea of a peer-to-peer -peer encrypted protocol uh, was really attracting. And also, in order for us to um, have the banks move forward, which are typic not, typically not innovative, uh, when you speak to a bank today, they are more followers than early adopters, uh, we needed the buzzword, and blockchain at the time, to them, was associated to innovation. So it was really... Um, the crossroads of, of hype and technology where we had a chance to make them move together. So I would say it was both a, an opportunity, uh, and, and we basically capitalized on the buzzword, as well as a, as a technical fit for purpose between uh, the peer-to-peer -peer nature of the network and uh, the cryptography aspect, the privacy that uh, we had from using the technology. Thank you. I know that both of you, you are really uh, involved in the blockchain community and you participate in, in multiple, multiple events and seen a lot of blockchain cases out there. And uh, uh, actually, I think that Farhin is just joining. So before the first, uh, the next question, <laughs> let's get her in. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> So for him, we're going to put you right on the spot. <laughs> Thanks for joining. So um, Farhin and I uh, have been, uh, are we known each other in the blockchain community for uh, quite some time. Uh, but um, uh, can you tell the audience uh, so a little bit about yourself and how did you, uh, how, uh, where, where do you work at the blockchain uh, front? Okay, hi, uh, my name's Farheen Ali, and I'm an entrepreneur and an electrical engineer, and I'm the president of the IEEE Dallas Blockchain Group, and also the founder and president of um, BSEN, which is uh, a group that I started before IEEE had a blockchain initiative. And you have a very interesting story how you got started with blockchain. And we've talked about this multiple times, but uh, please share it with the audience. I'm sure that they would be thrilled to know. Okay. Um, in 2017, I started a blockchain um, meetup for much needed educational um, resources when my 17 year old wanted to build a mining machine. And I had, <laughs> I had no idea what this was. It was a specialized computer for. Um, you know, that used expensive components that gaming machines used. And we had just gone through making him, buying him stuff for a gaming machine. And I was like, uh-uh, we're going we're gonna to make sure we're not throwing away money here. and We're going to figure this out. So um, there was no real resources on the Internet. There was none at school. And um, the schools were kind of just afraid of, um, at that time, they were afraid of, you know, this Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. What is this? Nonsense. So, um, but anyway, I just start, started going to meetups, and we didn't have anything in Frisco, so we started holding meetups there, and we did that, and um, that's how I noticed beyond 
getting Bitcoin, um, what was really useful is um, what it can do for decentralizing other things, such as research. Um, I think that can really change healthcare um, and free us from money being dictating what's effective and what's not. So uh, right now our medical um, institutions, I feel, are a little hijacked by the pharmaceutical industry, and I think doctors will also um, agree on this. But if you can have more decentralized research, you can have everything um, uh, have a stand and um, opportunities. So that's how I got into block That's why I stayed in it and then started the IEEE blockchain group because um, I was part of IEEE for the last 30 years. And does anyone know what IEEE is? Okay, good, we have like four hands. Um, it's the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. It's the world's largest um, technical professional organization with almost half a million members uh, worldwide. And um, the fastest growing uh, memberships are actually internationally, but pretty much Every educational institution has a, um, has a group, a student group. Um, many, many industry um, uh, executives um, belong to the group. Um, every serious technical organization is in there. And so there's a lot of brain trust there that's um, there to advance uh, standards and the technology and for collaboration so we can accomplish more than any one individuals. All right. Very good. So um, all of these three members are very active parts in the blockchain community here in Dallas and uh, participate in many events uh, here locally as well as uh, elsewhere and they have great visibility to different kind of uh, blockchain use cases. So if you would have to pick uh, the most interesting use case that for blockchain that you've ever encountered, aside of your own, of course, <laughs> what would it be? Let's start with Ben. The one that I thought was very interesting because it really is going to impact a lot of people is I go back and look at something that happens in a lot of developing countries like India, for example. Right? Uh, land ownership is a big issue for most people in most developing countries. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that something that we take for granted here in this country is, you know, every time I go and buy land, there's a title company, and you're almost guaranteed that the piece of land or house or whatever you're buying, and the title company gives you a title, you know that this title now belongs to you. It's a simple process of trust. And that is abused so badly in countries like India and a lot of other developing countries because it, the paperwork is not digitized, so if you go and say, this is a piece of land I own, there's probably 10 other people who can say, hey, I have a piece of paper which says I own this land, right? And it all depends on how much money you're able to give or bribe some government official or whoever is recording that, and the land could, you know, the property that you own could automatically get transferred to somebody else, right? So something as simple as blockchain could help solve the big problem because now, information or about the ownership of land is digitized, it cannot be changed by a corrupt government official. And this was a project which was, I believe, done in Peru for the first time, and you know, it showed that this really had an economic impact in the country, and that's something that now the government of India is seriously looking at it, and other developing countries are looking at it. So that's, it kind of hits you real close, saying, you know, this has, yeah, technology is cool, but it has a real, societal impact that it can really, you know, make a difference. Very good. How about you, Farheen? Um, well, last year I read an article about how in Lebanon, Syrian refugees were, um, the UN was using blockchain technology to issue food to the refugees. And so what they would do is rather than um, just giving money, um, to buy the food, they'd, all, they'd just give the food, and the refugees would come and have their eye retina scanned, and that would unlock their uh, blockchain for their food delivery, and that's how they were um, being delivered food, and records were being kept, and it was very um, transparent and hard to um, steal resources 
that were intended for uh, food. That, that, that was a good one. Um, in, in all the uses that uh, I've seen so far, I think that the, uh, the obvious one that um, we should see uh, coming up in the next few years um, we will not be a cryptocurrency, uh, but uh, basically a digital token, which basically is a digital representation of fiat money. So as you know, the US dollar that we use every day is a fiat money as well as euros or what have you. And uh, interestingly, last week, uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, heading the, uh, the IMF, issued a recommendation that governments should look at uh, tokenizing their currencies which means that today, uh, when you're using a paper representation of fiat money, you would be able to use an electronic equivalent of that. Uh, th there's immediate benefits to that, uh, such as, you know, you, I mean, losing your money would become really difficult, and uh, transactions would be uh, natively electronic, so you wouldn't have to use cash. So to me, that's the, uh, the, the immediate benefit that I'm seeing, having the, the broad adoption and the broad impact, being able to use a blockchain-based solution for a digitized fiat currency. So, Yana, can I just add to what Farin said? And that's a that's a great use case. I'll just add a little bit to that particular news item. Why that's more of an impact is, from a refugee perspective, most of them are just fleeing the war zone, right? So they do not have time to get their passports or any kind of a document saying you know where they are from. So, and the question is, you know, how do you know identify an individual knowing that I do not have anything that identifies me as a person anymore to say that you're a refugee or where you're coming from, whether in Syria or Lebanon or wherever, right? So identity itself becomes a huge impact. And for a lot of people who maybe first come to this country, you might have great credit record back home in India, China, wherever you come here, you have zero credit history. So I can't even go and open a bank account. I cannot open and get a driver's license or anything unless I have a friend or I go to a university and the university gives me papers. If I come straight to come here to work, I cannot open a bank account unless my friend goes with me. I can't buy a car. So question is, you might be extremely rich, well off in your country, but you have basically zero credit when you come to this country. So how do you know, transfer that credit over to wherever you want to go, something like a blockchain really helps you because your identity can go with you and you have the full ownership around it. So no passport, no driver's license, these are all Company, countries or government agencies without authenticating who you are, and if there's a way to transfer that across borders, it becomes much more easier. Yeah, and very quickly, I just want to add that there is an, an opportunity here for uh, developing countries to leapfrog, to leapfrog the uh, inefficiencies of the, uh, the, the standard hub and spoke model of networking. We've typically seen uh, Africa leapfrogging landlines and going straight to cell phones because it was a more efficient iteration of the technology. And blockchain is a more efficient uh, book of record. So I, I can definitely see them just ignoring the initial phase of central servers that we've seen you know, for the past uh, 40 years and go straight to a, a blockchain-based solution. That would make a lot of sense, actually. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So developing countries and uh, fiat currency. Uh, JC, uh, do you see that um, the developing countries would be the first ones to go to the adoption of fiat currencies? Then, in, in so Georgia? fiat currencies are everywhere, right? This is yeah. the currencies as we know them today. Fiat means trust. Yeah. So everything that represents a trust, such as a dollar bill, is a fiat currency. So uh, they, they have these already today. The the problem with a broad adoption of, of a blockchain-based solution is that in a blockchain world, every participant has an identity, which is typically um, existing inside the context of a node, which is a, some kind of a computing unit that can represent you and can execute some logic for you. And in the current state of things, the notion of a custodian that will be running that node for you is not, yet, is not yet widely available. So let's say if everybody in this room uh, wanted to participate in a, a blockchain implementation of you know, whatever we're talking about, you would need a node on the network. Uh, with the cryptos today, that could be your phone, but if you want something more serious than a phone, you would have to operate your own computer. So I think the, the thing that's holding us right now is a model where you have a trustee that you, you designate as your node operator, which could be, I mean, in our case, that should be your bank, could be your bank, for example, that's running your node, and you trust your bank for running your identity on the blockchain. 
but in other um, implementation, uh, we would need this concept of being able to trust someone to run the node on your behalf. So you don't have to take care of it, because otherwise there will be a burden to have a device that's storing that, that identity for you. So I, I still think that technically there are some hurdles to a, a massive adoption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well then, um, as we all know, IBM's done a lot of blockchain implementations. Uh, and um, the Walmart, Walmart food traceability being probably the most famous one of them all. Uh, can you share with us uh, that what kind of benefits are, you, are your customers looking when they do a blockchain implementation? I, mean, I can talk specifically about uh, food safety one. I can't talk about other uh, you know, blockchain from a benefit perspective because uh, in, a, in the case of uh, food trust or food safety, right? So it was interesting. These were some of the statistics and numbers that were shared by the Walmart folks, so I can't take credit for it, right? So while, while driving here, I was just hearing on NPR this news about the big uh, romaine lettuce uh, E. coli outbreak. So in case you have not heard it, they're just saying stop eating romaine lettuce because there's some E. coli outbreak. So if you're planning to have Thanksgiving dinner, just avoid romaine lettuce. Now, mm -hmm. the CDC has still has not figured out which particular farm or wherever is causing it. Um, but apparently there was a similar outbreak in 2008 for spinach. And uh, about 113, you know, it was, it was in about 24 different states in the US. Uh, you know, several thousand people were hospitalized, about 13 people actually died because of severe kidney failure. And it took the CDC about three weeks to identify exactly what the source of the contamination was. Um, and then eventually it ended up being, you know, one particular farm. It was one day's production, uh, which was cause of this whole outbreak. But in those three weeks time, what has happened from an industry perspective, right? Everybody threw out spinach, not just Walmart, Kroger, any grocer who is selling spinach throws them out. Every restaurant who has it throws them out. And all the farmers who are growing spinach, they basically are wiped out because nobody wants to buy spinach anymore. They might have some stuff, but people, and there's a new saying, do not eat spinach, nobody eats spinach, right? So livelihoods are destroyed. So the actual impact for it is a lot more than just purely for Walmart. Now, so they're also looking at it from, so how does a company, a grocer like a Walmart or a Kroger or you know, Albertson deal with a situation like this when there's a you know, lettuce outbreak or E. coli outbreak or salmonella outbreak? So they have to go through a recall process, which means they have to identify which stores have what products. You know, most of them have a lot number or something else, but if I can pinpoint specific lot numbers that I need to throw away, and I can do it faster, it saves me a lot of time and money, right? So when we are doing the pilot, we were doing, we did two pilots, one in China, one in the US. In the US, we were tracking uh, mangoes coming in from Mexico all the way to the border and how it flows into the system. And in China, it was all about pork uh, because there was a lot of news in China, if you have you know, been following the Chinese uh, food market, uh, they had a lot of contaminated meat. And uh, the issue used to be, you know, uh, this Walmart used to have these massive stores in China and they had these uh, uh, live fish tanks, right? So you can go in and say, I want this fish or this lobster and you know, they'll wait for you and you can buy it and take it home. Now the reality was these were not actually owned by Walmart. These were like independent guys. Walmart was just renting this space. And quite often, uh, you know, there's, the FDA equivalent of Chinese government would come in and they would look at it, the fish and say, nope, this seems old, so you need to throw it out. Or the store manager would get fined or he would be hauled into jail saying, you know, you're selling you know, stale fish or stale seafood. And it would take a lot of time and energy for somebody to go bail them out. And in the meanwhile, the store doesn't have a manager to function. And it also gives a bad image for Walmart as a company in China, right? So those were the genesis of two projects. And then they said, okay, let's not create something specific for China, something specific for the US. It, this is not just a Walmart only problem. This is a whole industry-wide problem that if you have a problem with spinach or food or any produce, all the grocers, everybody gets affected, right? And that's how we started doing the pilot. So when we were doing the pilot for mangoes in, in coming in from Mexico, 
uh, there was an outbreak. And typically, it used to take them about two or three weeks to find out exactly which farm was the issue. Uh, with the blockchain, they were able to identify in less than you know, four or five seconds. So it, that tells you how quickly you can now identify which farm and are quickly isolated, you just throw them out. And you can also, also identify from this farm which particular stores now carry my spinach or lettuce or whatever, and I can just target and do recalls. So think about the amount of waste of food that you can prevent by, just by doing this process. So basically trust and, there's, uh, there's a trust factor, right? Number one, you can do a faster food recall. And then you can start thinking in terms of where do you take it next, right? So you think in terms of you know, some, something as simple as organic food, right? You go to Kroger, you go to Albertson, you go to Walmart, and you see a gallon of milk which says organic. What's the difference? I mean, they all all milk. They all say organic. So... Yeah, so it, so price could be one factor, but if, if if the price doesn't matter to you, the differential is like it's so uh, it's not like Whole Foods, right? It's the whole paycheck kind of stuff. Uh, but then just beyond milk, there are all these labels which say it's organic. Now, do you trust the labels? Because just because some label is fancy green, like, you know, Kroger might say, you know, and they have their own branding which looks like, hey, it's organic. But if you start looking at the ingredients, which one is organic, which one is not? So you are just trusting the grocer or the manufacturer to say that if something is labeled organic, it is organic, right? But what if there's a way for you as a consumer now to scan the barcode on that label, and it tells you exactly where it came from, how it has grown, and how long it was you know, before it got harvested. So that gives you the whole provenance of a particular, and if Walmart is able to offer something, that level of visibility on their food safety, you, the customer, would say, yeah, I pay attention more to your point, but I would still go to Walmart because I can trust what they're selling me as organic compared to a Kroger or somebody else. Right. Uh, very quickly, I just want to add something to that. So um, obviously, I mean, in, in our daily lives, uh, we, we all know that we can track many things with a great amount of details. I mean, if you order anything on, on Amazon today, uh, you could track your package from the, you know, the factory into the truck. Into you actually have a guy taking a picture of your package at your doorstep, and your doorstep can take a picture of the guy delivering you, so you can see in great detail what's going on. So, we already have the technology. I mean, irrespective of blockchain, to to perform the tracking. And I think where where blockchain is really making a difference is that you can now have this tracking also implying there is a consensus. So if you have different parties that are involved in the chain of delivering that food to you or whatever good you're, you're trying to get, and these parties have conflicting interests, <clears throat> such as the guy who's delivering, the guy who's producing, the guy who's storing, all of them can be blamed. The, the thing that matters here is that at some point where the, the, the asset is being transferred from uh, whoever is storing to whoever is carrying, there is a consensus that at that point, the, the food was in a good condition. Do we agree? Yes, we're going to store that on the blockchain. So tracking is one thing, and the consensus that we agree on something, and the, the chain, the custodian chain has agreed all along the way that uh, the asset has not depreciated or was not compromised, to me is the, the key value that blockchain provides to the table making sure that all these parties at some point agree on something and we can follow that chain of truth from the producer to the, the delivery. So is the tracking and the consensus uh, important to, to the banking customers as well? It, it is. Um, and interestingly right now, uh, because of the problem I was mentioning earlier that um, it, it's not usable at the retail level, so us as consumers uh, don't really have direct benefit. We have indirect benefits such as, you know, uh, making sure we know where the food comes from. But in the banking industry, banks between themselves are extremely inefficient, uh, even though we don't really see it, because we know from the facade looks actually good. The, the way the transactions are happening is extremely inefficient. I mean, in our space, the, 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 one of the products we're working on is for lending where, let's say, you know, as American Airlines, uh, you want to borrow money to buy a new plane. So these loans run in the billions of dollars. And uh, when banks together get together to, to provide that loan, they basically split the loan. So let's say, if I'm American Airlines and I need a billion dollars to open a new route to some destination, I go to Chase and I'm, I'm, I'm asking for $1 billion in loan. 
Chase will uh, take that loan, split the loan between other banks, and instead of taking the risk themselves, so taking the 100% of that loan, they're going to slice it to other banks, so Citi will be there, Goldman will be there, and they will all take a share, agree on the position in that loan, and go back to American Alliance and say, here is your money. And all the, the this management behind the scene that happens between the arranger, which in this case was Chase, and all the other banks that are taking a slice in that loan, uh, is what we're, we're, we're operating on blockchain. If it wasn't for what we're doing, uh, this industry today is generating 19 million faxes uh, a year. So if, if, you need to, to, if you want to visualize that, uh, if you put a stack of paper, that's the equivalent of a one mile high stack of paper. So I don't know if you know the, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, that's two Burj Khalifa stacked up. <laughs> So th this is the type of inefficiencies that the financial industry uh, can, can address with this type of technology where they need a consensus. Uh, they obviously, they have conflicting interests because you know, at some point they own the money, at some point the agent bank will receive a payment and they need to, to distribute that payment between all the lenders. <laughs> so the, the, this need for a consensus is something that the bank could really take, really take advantage of. And I see this as a first step towards uh, global adoption, because if they become versed with the technology, uh, they can then become a, a viable custodian. So I could then use my bank as a custodian for my digital assets, because they will be versed with that technology. But the, the first iteration for us is to educate the banks to adopt this technology so that in turn we can benefit from it as a consumer. So it's, it's kind of the first generation of blockchain adoption, the corporate adoption, uh, such as you know, the Walmart use case, or in, in our case, the bank's use case, is, is putting us in the right direction. Very good. So Farheen, you are involved in eSports. So uh, can you share us a little bit uh, of uh, what kind of benefits is the eSports industry, which is actually a big industry, mm -hmm. is looking for when using blockchain? Well, um, esports is um, the children right now are already used to not children, just even adult children are used to um, digital assets, um, skins, swords, special um, clothes, and um, esports also gives rewards. So, for to be able to have digital collectibles, that's one thing, and then the other thing is. Um, you know, back when the internet first started, we all thought that um, industry, business to business, would advance the internet because the internet has so much promise for business. But it turns out it was more um, gaming that advanced the internet. And si Dr. Simon Mack um, gave a keynote at a presentation at a conference that we recently concluded where the IEEE had a blockchain launch. And one of the things he said was he thinks that blockchain technology is going is going to really be advanced from business to consumer and consumer being esports and gaming and i agree with that because that's where a lot of um, interest and money is so um, uh, rewarding and being able to um, take your digital assets and collectibles did that answer mm -hmm. thank you Okay, so Farhin, um, you are, you're the head of uh, IEEE Dallas blockchain chapter. Mm -hmm. Can you also tell us a little bit about the standards uh, within the blockchain industry and the work that you're doing there? Okay. Well, um, the group has started an initiative for a standards working group, and um, we were able to have the chairman of that group for the International um, Blockchain Initiative. Uh, here in October, and one of the things that IEEE is trying to do is get the industry to collaborate. You know, it's one thing to have um, individual initiatives and protocols and softwares, but um, kind of like back when we had video streaming, there were all kinds of different protocols, and now it's HTTPS. It doesn't really matter. Nobody thinks that about it, that that's how we're having our content delivered. But at some point, you know, there has to be some kind of consensus in the language that we're going to agree on and standards. And IEEE is um, 
a large organization that stands to be the one to um, help us uh, set some standards. And so there's opportunities for anyone um, who's in engineering, anyone who's in project management, because all these engineering people you know, often have IT project managers. And in fact, um, software um, is where most of the jobs are. And so I'd highly encourage anyone um, that wants to have maybe a job in blockchain um, management, getting involved with the IEEE. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, are you, uh, with IBM, involved in creating any standards? I personally am not, but IBM definitely is. Uh, there are a lot of uh, folks from IBM who are part of the IEEE standards. So IEEE is definitely one of the standards that IBM contributes to and you know is definitely involved in. And there are probably other consortiums which are looking at it. So one of the things that IBM has been doing is at least the, uh, the big blockchain that they uh, contributed to is called the Hyperledger Fabric, which is part of the Linux Foundation. So Linux is an open source uh, operating system. There's a whole organization which manages features function of that particular uh, OS. And it's under the same umbrella as where Hyperledger comes from. So IBM is one of the original contributors. There are 250 or 300 plus different companies, right from Intel to Accenture to Cisco to you know, most of the tech companies, they're all contributing to Hyperledger. And there are, like uh, what Farina was saying, there are also other competing ledgers. You have Corda, you have R3, you got Ethereum, and of course Bitcoin. All of them are in kind of like open source space difference you got to look at it from an open source is there's open source and there's something called open governance, right? So the software itself could be open source, but the governance model is not open. So Ethereum is a good example of that. It's it's open source project, but the governance is not open. So tomorrow if Vitalik decides, hey, I'm going to change something, he can do it because he's the governing guy, right? He wrote it. It's a very smart, brilliant guy, no doubt. Now they're trying to change that model, so eventually they will get to an open governance. Now, the fa fabric definitely is part of the open source plus an open governance model, so it's not IBM saying this is how it needs to go because now there are 300 people who are in the governing board who all together decide what needs to come in the next release feature function. So there's advantage and disadvantage of that. One is, you know, things don't move as fast because it's, uh, you know, consensus. <laughs> get a committee which is deciding what goes into the next feature function. And bodies like IEEE definitely help because they have been doing this for a lot longer than anybody else's and they've been around for a lot longer. They have set standards in all technology fields right from, you know, whether you obviously mentioned TCP, IP and even a lot of the W3 standards are now adopted by IEEE and, you know, they're, and they, they have the cachet, right? They're known worldwide as these are really smart, intelligent people defining the standards that everybody needs to adopt, so. So JC, uh, in the banking and finance industry, uh, well, it, uh, there's obviously big standards, SWIFT and uh, different, different kinds of methods have to be agreed upon between banks in order to transfer money. Uh, do you see the same uh, thing happening around blockchain? Uh, is the banking and finance uh, industry coming up with their own standards, or are you following uh, generic ones? Well, the, the banks <clears throat> don't really have their own standards, but uh, the, the whole blockchain story with banks is kind of biased toward uh, a vendor named uh, R3, because the way they, they built themselves was uh, starting with um, a consortium of, of banks. So they started from scratch as being something funded by banks. So de facto, it was very easy for us as early adopters to go back to these banks and say, hey, you guys have a stake in, in this blockchain implementation, and now we can actually do something worth with it. I mean, that's worth your time. We have an actual business case where you can use that technology. So uh, R3 is a company that has a, a block specific blockchain implementation uh, named Corda, which is... Uh, which has an open source uh, leg as well as an enterprise uh, paid for version, uh, which doesn't have the open governance. Uh, they, they're working on it, but you're right. It's definitely something that's important to include in the big picture. Uh, so I'm not saying that Corda is the de facto standard for the financial industry, but it's definitely popular 
And it's definitely a door opener. So when you show up, I would say if today you were an entrepreneur and um, you, you want to, to pitch to a bank and you say, hey, I came with the next big thing, you know, my, I created my own blockchain, I think it would be a very tough sell uh, if you don't go for either Hyperledger or, or Corda, sorry, for or Fabric or Corda. It would be very hard to get into banks because, uh, A, uh, they already have a very hard time adopting new technologies. So for them to go through this, you know, um, work of, of uh, changing their security models, and, and believe me, it's the, 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 toughest, the toughest thing we do today is not so much about implementing our use case, it's about educating the banks around the peer-to-peer -peer and blockchain. So I would say the, the, the best value you can get from this kind of a normalization that we're seeing right now is to build some uh, business logic on top of an existing uh, implementation, such as Corda or Fabric, as opposed to try to, try to reinvent a new blockchain. So th there's no standard per se. I, I wish we, we had a standard, and I'm sure that three years from now we won't care whether it's Corda or Fabric. It's definitely coming, but uh, we don't have a, a real standard per se right now. So we kind of uh, briefly touched uh, maybe a, a little bit about the uh, the, uh, the obstacles of blockchain adoption here. So if we don't have standards and if we have scalability issues, they are probably the couple of uh, most, uh, most known ones. Uh, is that what you think, uh, Ben, also? Or do you, do you see other uh, challenges with blockchain adoption? Uh, standards really are not really stopped from an adoption perspective. It's more, they made, they, the industry is so new, right? So it's almost like any new technology. There will be competing standards till industry or the marketplace decides, hey, these are the top two or top three. So like, you know, JC was saying, Corda and Fabric, they seem to be, we run into these and you don't go wrong with either one of those. Uh, the bigger difference right now seems to be more what they call as permission versus permissionless blockchains. So anybody who has, I know, you know, you mentioned not to use the word Bitcoin, but I still have to use Bitcoin here. So Bitcoin and Ethereum, they are what they call as permissionless blockchains. So they are public blockchains, means anybody in the world can participate in those networks. Uh, it's good from a public broader adoption perspective, but then if you look at it from an enterprise perspective, there's an issue, right? Enterprises have to follow certain rules and regulations. You know, anybody who has to do anything, any kind of financial transaction, you know, before you can open an account, they have something called KYC, know your customer. Or if I'm trying to transfer money somewhere else, there's specific rules and regulations around anti-money laundering, AML. So for all those things, you need to know exactly who the participant is. You cannot have an anonymous participant dealing with you. So totally permissionless blockchain does not really work if I'm talking about an enterprise business, whether it's Walmart or any of those banks they only deal with people that they know of. So the question is, how do I now have somebody give me permission to participate, and I can authenticate who you are? It's just not giving permission, right? So that's where the big difference is, and there's all this debate about, you know, is a permission blockchain a true blockchain or not? Because when you start doing permissions, the whole genesis of what blockchain meant, right, which is it's a distributed ledger, there's no central governing authority, that kind of goes away because now you are saying there's a central governing authority which is saying, hey, you can participate in this network, which means, or is really a clue blockchain from that you know, sense. So that's the you know, philosophical, philosophical debate going on in that space. But most enterprises are going towards what they call as a permission blockchain. So the food trust, I talked at Walmart or the supply chain or know your suppliers, they want to be really clear on who they are doing business with and who their suppliers are. So. They can't let anybody say, hey, I got, I'm the little farmer who has lettuce and I want to supply to Walmart, I'll get on this blockchain. No, you're not getting on the blockchain unless I tell you that you can do business with me. So that's, that's a bigger issue versus this. And then you rightly pointed about scale, right? So when you get into permissionless blockchain like Bitcoin and Ethereum, scale becomes an issue. Yes, you've got a lot of nodes. But then as you have a lot of nodes, then you take a lot more time to build a consensus. JC was talking about consensus. 
which I'll just try to explain it in a few words, which is when a transaction is going in or you're creating a transaction, all the participants or a majority of the participants are agreeing that this is a valid transaction before it gets committed, right? Otherwise, think in terms of a dollar bill. If I give a dollar bill to one of you guys, the same dollar bill cannot be given to somebody else because that's a physical mm -hmm. bill that I'm giving to you. In an electronic currency, there's nothing that prevents me from making multiple copies of the dollar bill and giving it to 10 different people. So how do you avoid this thing called double spend? The same dollar bill cannot be spent twice, and that's where the consensus on all the algorithms have been designed in a, from a Bitcoin perspective to prevent the double spend. So when a network is huge where, you know, if I'm talking about currency, I cannot say that, hey, I don't know this person, so I cannot give him a dollar bill, but I can trade with somebody in China I had never met, and I can send him a bill, right? Because he's going to, trust, you know, if I decide to trust him and he sends me some good, I can pay him. So in that scenario, if I want to do it with a, something like a Bitcoin Ethereum, the consensus algorithm takes, you know, has to be something that all the participants can somehow figure out that this transaction is valid and it's not going to be a double spend. And right now it's something called proof of work, which takes a lot of compute power to solve, and it takes a lot of time. So a typical transaction takes almost 75 minutes before it gets committed. So you do a Bitcoin transaction now, 75 minutes later, the whole system says, yeah, this is a valid transaction, and that guy sees it. And this time actually keeps on increasing as more and more nodes come in. Now think in terms of an enterprise business. If I place an order with Walmart online, walmart.com or amazon.com, are you willing to wait for 75 minutes before somebody says, yep, I, I got your order and I'll send it to you now? You're gonna walk away, right? So, it's, so that's one of the big issues in terms of scalability and throughput, which a permission blockchain, because now I know who the participants are, it's a much more controlled network, I can use a different algorithm than a proof of work, which is much more faster and scalable. So those are the big things that we see. So, mm -hmm. right. so Farheen, uh, what do you see as the biggest obstacle in blockchain adoption? I think I agree, it's scalability. And I think what's gonna happen in the end is there's gonna be a combination for interactions to happen. There will be permissioned private blockchains and external blockchains that we interact with. So. Um, for example, even with research, um, you're not going to have just anyone being able to um, contribute data until you're, uh, you have some kind of credentials, et cetera. And so, um, but eventually um, it will be made available. Just think of the internet. We have intranets, and then we go to the World Wide Web. It's probably going to be just the same thing, and it's all about scalability. And there are um, alternatives now to smart contracts that are coming out that are permissionless and um, as well. So um, for banking, it'll probably be R3, Corda, and um, Hyperledger for supply chain and a lot of enterprise uses. And then, and then there will be a settling elsewhere um, on a public blockchain. And it's going to um, probably be advanced by esports because you know um, there's a lot of uh, money in these games. Uh, for example, there's a game called Dota 2. Um, the international um, tournament had 26 million dollars as the prize pool, and so there were three teams that split it. Split it, and so when you have that kind of money. Um, there's there's a lot of incentive to make sure that um, the the scores are right and and also now um, industry is trying to get involved with this new um, this hard to reach um, base that could potentially buy from them and connect with and so what they want to do is try to connect with them and so they're going to be involved um, and one of the things that we're trying that they're trying to do also is put in digital assets that can go from game to game so suppose you've gotten um, an X score in one place that should be worth something not in addition to just 
the people who won the millions of dollars. What about if you're just a regular gamer and you have some assets? Well, um, if you're a game design company, you might want to allow your assets from one game to be transferable to another. And so those kinds of things will really accelerate adoption faster than any of these bigger, nobler causes probably will. How about you, Tracy? Yes. Sorry, I have a last one. But first, I, I want to use Farin as, as my trustee. Could you please read the highlighted text here? Sure. I'll need glasses. <laughs> Pay me 9,000 via Bitcoin to the address 1MCV, 8MWLG, capital L, lower GW. OK, you don't want me to read all that? OK. So that, that's an actual email that my, my wife forwarded to me uh, two hours ago. Um, no, literally, literally. So it's basically some random guy that has figured out her password and that now he's trying to extort her for some $9,000 and, and asking us to pay via Bitcoin. So we're not going to talk about Bitcoins, but to me, <laughs> the, the biggest hurdle to adoption of, of, of Bitcoin in general is that right now, in terms of identity management, we are at the equivalent of where we were in the early 90s with the internet where everybody could claim to be anybody they wanted, which is basically uh, the reason why you have all these issues we've seen with the cryptocurrencies, which is why the blockchain today is being used for the good stuff as well as terrible things such as extortion. And uh, until we have a, a viable way uh, to manage the identities so you can say, you can claim to be who you say you are, where you have the digital equivalent of an ID, and if you say you are who you say you are, in fact, you have proof. So you can um, do things on behalf of a, you know, do, do things on your behalf, and nobody else can do it for you. Uh, I think that's the biggest hurdle to adoption from my perspective. Very good. Um, we'll take one quick question, and then we'll open it up for the audience. And the last question, I'll, I'll start with Ben. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who would like to get involved with blockchain? Um, this is a new technology, right? So just the fact that you know, we are sitting here doesn't make us experts. We are still learning, right? So you know, every time I go to one of these panels, I learn from the panel participants. They have a different use case. And so if you guys are interested, there are a lot of free learning available, whether it's IBM, Ethereum, you know, Corda, with a lot of tutorials and you know, YouTube videos, and like uh, Farin is talking about, she organizes meetups, there are a lot of meetups in Dallas. I would say just go start talking to other people, and if you are a coder, just get involved and, you know, write some code or learn how to code. I mean, very, very simple to get started. So uh, and this, the way I look at it, this is going to kind of be the future for computing. And it's, it's, they're already talking about being as transformative as the internet was now. How much of that is hype? How much of that is going to be real? But you know, we are all in IT, and we are all get caught up in the hype. So for now, this is the cool stuff. So I'm all in. So you know, uh, go for it. And for him, what was your question? <laughs> so what advice would you give to oh. someone uh, who is who wants to get into blockchain? Okay, um, I would say um, blockchain is a language and that is an exchange of value. So the best way you really learn what a blockchain is is by um, human interaction. It's a language. You know, The best way you learn talking is by talking with native speakers. So go to meet with people in person and I would recommend you play with tokens. Don't think of them as money because they're, you know, it's don't play with anything you can't afford to lose. So that's how you kind of learn a little bit about it. That's how I viewed it. But then, you know, go with what your real expertise is. You're, I imagine most of you are project managers or you might have come from different areas. There is so many different um, uses for it. And at the end of the day, it's just basically advancing a new technology. Use what you're passionate about and get involved in that area. And so um, that's what I'd recommend. And then um, 
you know, so if you're a project manager, all these projects are happening, and they're going to need managing. So um, software people really could use some help with that, um, and as well as engineers. Um, the other thing is IEEE is, is going to, I'm not doing meetups uh, many anymore, um, but we're we there, there's a lot of conferences you can go to, and we're gonna. Do, we just did one conference in October, and then we'll have one other large event in 2019. Um, the other thing is, you could just go to blockchain.ieee.org. There's a lot of resources there, papers, etc. Go to YouTube. Go to Udemy. Just watch videos, and that's how you should get started. And then go meet people. All right. I think we've all heard the phrase, uh, if everything you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And, and blockchain is a big hammer, right? That can take care of a few things. But there are many technologies out there. Blockchain is just the newest buzzword that we like to use. Um, it's only useful for very specific use cases where uh, you need to prove that you agree with a kind of party. And uh, there are many technologies that are doing other things much better than blockchain. And I would say that the, the, the easy mistake to do right now would be to jump all in into blockchain and try to you know, stuff the turkey and put as much business cases as you could into blockchain. If you don't need consensus, you don't need blockchain. Uh, if you don't need to agree at the same time, to have two parties at the same time that agree on a transaction or agree on something really specific, if you just need to send data over, or if you just need to, to you know, broadcast information, blockchain is not the right tool for that. So I guess my recommendation would be to, A, take advantage, uh, and I'm here, I'm, I'm, I'm joining Venn, there's a lot of free knowledge out there, all the vendors, have these white papers, uh, online courses that you can use. So educate yourself. See what the tool actually is about. There are many flavors of blockchain. And I know we use blockchain as an interchangeable term. It turns out that implementations are fairly different. Some of them have, have, have completely opposing objectives. So see what's available out there. A Bitcoin blockchain has nothing to do with with a fabric blockchain, for example, and you know, and we can put on the map several blockchains and see which one are actually useful for what you're trying to achieve. But just use the technology where it makes sense. Um, it's very handy to use blockchain as a pry bar. So if you want to get into the innovation labs, you can say, "Hey, I use blockchain," so that will get you in the door. But eventually, it comes down to the business case and the value you provide to the end user. So I would say that uh, blockchain is a, is a very handy tool, but it's not, it's not a one-size-fits-all. So you just need to use it in a way that really makes sense to you. Thank you. And now we'll move to the questions from the audience. I'll just bring the mic over. Okay. Hi, I'm Kristen Haggard. I'm a senior purchasing manager with Linux International, and I'm passionate about supply chain. So I have a couple questions about that. I came here tonight because I was really interested in how this could affect our complex contract negotiations. Um, and and it, starting with the question of where do I need consensus is such a great place to start. So thank you for that. I wanted to ask you, sir, you talked about know your supplier. Could you walk us through a, a tactical example? How does that work? How, at the, at the root of it, how does it work? Well, that network is actually just being built. There are like two or three big uh, manufacturing companies which are part of it. The whole idea around know your suppliers is when you look at a big uh, company, whether it's like Walmart or PepsiCo or IBM, right? they got lots, lots of suppliers for their end products. Uh, some of the statistics say it's just the process of onboarding a new supplier takes as much as four to five months. And it might cost you know three four thousand dollars, and then you have to maintain it, right? So when you talk about some of these big complex supply chain and their providers, you have to think in terms of you know something as simple as you know where are where are they based? Are they minority owned, women owned? Then you get into you know things like you know are they sustainable? Are they environmentally friendly? And then you have you know, country specific regulations. If, you know if you are trying to 
source something out of South Africa, I mean, they have separate rules. Brazil has separate rules. So all these rules and regulations need to be kept track of. So the idea is, and for some of these end, I would say, suppliers, they're supplying not just to a PepsiCo or Walmart. They are probably the ingredient supplier to multiple other companies, right? So the whole idea of no air supplier is we are, IBM is helping sponsor that network similar to the Food Network one. Is so we're gonna target some of the big industry categories, whether it's manufacturing, high tech, consumer goods, retail, and look at suppliers. For example, you know, I think Cisco or you know, one of those you know, electronic manufacturers now on the networks. So think in terms of, okay, if Cisco is now on the network, any company which wants to source from Cisco, for them, the supplier onboarding is gonna be extremely easy because all the documentation that Cisco has provided is on the blockchain. All you do is subscribe to the blockchain and that information gets unloaded onto your system. You might use SAP or Ariba or Oracle or whatever as internal procurement system, but you don't have to worry about collecting that information from Cisco directly because Cisco's information is now on the blockchain. You're participating in the blockchain and the network is now keeping track of changes to Cisco's you know, regulations and their certificates and all that, or any other news comes in, and you can get alerts automatically saying, hey, you know, these guys said they were supposed to be, you know, environmentally friendly and they were certified by this particular authority, but the certification is no longer valid. So you get an immediate notification. You can do, choose what to do with it. So the process of onboarding and long-term maintenance of the supplier becomes a lot simpler as the network grows. Is there any new infrastructure that is tied to blockchain? I mean, any, any, if you look at the, I don't know, last 150, 200 years, every revolution actually has roots that has an infrastructure with it, starting with you know, rail, uh, phone, electricity. In recent times, um, you know, nobody, nobody would talk about uh, streaming video to your house if there was no standard like Doxis, which most people haven't heard of it because it has no Bitcoin touch to it and never was. And now everybody's talking blockchain because of Bitcoin and the hype around it. But is, is there really anything more than um, maybe an improved technology or, or handshaking structure to support some of the transactions you were talking about that were done before with different means? Yeah, so there are, um, there's, I think there's two answers to that question. The first one is from an, an infrastructure perspective, the new offering surrounding blockchain, and that's pure software answer, is that uh, all the vendors out there, the uh, Amazon, the, the Google, and the, and the Azure, I mean Microsoft, uh, now have pre-packaged um, blockchain nodes that are running either uh, Fabric or Corda which is not really infrastructure. But in terms of hardware, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about this whole, I mean, you, you briefly touched earlier on the, on the mining requirements, like to compute, the, to, to mine blocks, which is something really specific to, to blockchain. Uh, something that, for example, does not exist in Corda. This notion of an anonymous miner does not exist. So we, it's not based on pure firepower to compute these, these algorithms. So the, the real change that we're seeing in terms of the hardware is that the Intel chipset now has an, an, a set of instruction called SGX, which is basically gives you the ability to execute code within, uh, within the, the, the processor, within a, a shell environment, uh, so that even within the same CPU, you would not be able to poke memory data from uh, between processes. So th there are some hardware side effects of blockchain. Uh, it's, it's very intricate in the sense that I don't think we can, maybe, maybe it's what you say, it's so far behind the front line that we don't see it and we, we don't see the immediate benefits, but there are some side effects in the hardware. So Intel is working on this right now. They actually have delivered uh, a working product that include these SGX instructions. Is that answering your question? Somewhat. I mean, it's, it's using the current, <coughs> current technologies. There are some, like you're saying, uh, identification or uh, control, putting controls around it, which is what Intel is trying to do to mm -hmm. 
force your identity from, or to prevent you from switching identities uh, on the fly or make it harder. I mean, the way, yeah. way, I would, way I would position it is, there's a hardware aspect to it, right? But the, the problem that blockchain has always been trying to solve, it's, it's a problem been there since the 1960s, 1950, which is about distributed computing, right? So if there are multiple computers on a network, they're all distributed, and at the end of the day, it's, it's a database. So when I'm committing into one database, how do I guarantee that the same information gets distributed across all the other nodes onto the database, right? So there were algorithms in place that have been there for a while, but now the question is how do I make sure that it happens in a way that all the parties can agree on, so that from an algorithm, but that's where things like consensus and then things like, you know, putting together the encryption around it, like, okay, yes, I'm distributing the data, but how do I guarantee that nobody else can see what's going in unless you are, so different pieces of computer science technology came together, and when Satoshi actually wrote the paper talking about how you can use something like this to create a digital currency and have an asset which is fully electronic and still guarantee that it cannot be hacked and you know everybody can agree to it. So that was, I think, the first time it got, I mean, there, was, there were different papers even before it in terms of how do I solve the issue of double spend and everything else, but his paper finally crystallized it. Hey, this is a working model and I can do something as simple as proof of work, which is a, solving a mathematical puzzle to say, this is a real transaction that everybody can agree on. And now that spawned, I guess, subsequent discussions about different ways of building it, how scaling it, and all that stuff. But that's, to your point, that's for the first genesis of a new, an internet or a TCP IP or something else. But that was, I would say, the you know, first step to it. And I'd like to add, um, there are those that say blockchain's been around for a while. What's different about Bitcoin is the consensus. So there was uh, something called uh, a Merkle trees where there would, in cryptography, the um, leaf nodes would have a hash of the parent node. And so that's a framework that's already been there. And so there were, were blockchains. So what blockchains are is a way to link um, a new transaction to the first transaction. And then in software, there is something, um, you might have heard of Slack. Those were basically blockchains where the software would branch off and whichever um, code that was, you could work on any of the uh, codes underneath there. So that's, that's a blockchain. But what's different now is the, um, untrusted partners and um, consensus. This may be the uh, same type of a question, but I'll ask it in a different way. The internet has several different things like secure socket layers and certificates. Is there going to be something like that for blockchain I think he's talking about infrastructure. What about the software point? So you can have one, you get to purchase a piece before you can be a part of it, or how does that work? So in the specific example of Corda, um, Corda is using, great question by the way, Corda is using a transport uh, called TLS, which is a, a standard uh, socket layer, um, which is right now in version 1.2. The reason why it's in version 1.2 is because version 1.1 got hacked. And at some point, we're going to go to 1.3, because 1.2 is going to be hacked. The question is not so much if, but when. So we are reusing industry standards in terms of, of uh, encrypting the data in, in transit, as well as encrypting the data in storage, by the way. So it's encrypted in both ways. And uh, the name of the game is just to be one step ahead of your competition. And I was mentioning earlier that uh, today, with a, with a quantum computer, you can uh, crack TLS 1.2 in 41 seconds. Not everybody has access to a quantum computer, but theoretically, if you have enough firepower, you can crack the cryptography rather quickly. Uh, with a regular computer, it takes you know months or years or whatever. But um, where I'm going with this is that there is nothing specific to Corda. Uh, Corda is reusing industry standards. We just need to be prepared to upgrade these, these standards whenever they get hacked. Yeah, this is a, is there a, a use case or is anybody 
working on, I guess, the possible application of this for the news, quote unquote, supply chain. You know, we were bombarded with so much, um, who knows where it's coming from, and uh, you can't trust, and that's only increasing exponentially. Is it, is, are you kind of aware of how this might apply to uh, eventually provide some trusted sources of information? Sorry, yes. Um, so th there are applications already. Uh, I have not seen anything, I'm not an expert on that very topic. Uh, there are things in the music industry that are somewhat similar so that the author can uh, claim ownership of their work and if their work gets modified somehow that you know you're not getting the original, you're getting a modified copy. So to some extent it's kind of similar. But it, it, it comes back to the issue of identity. Because if you are on a permissionless ledger, anybody can join at any point in time and claim. Actually, they don't even have to claim to be who they are. They just have a, this anonymous identity where they can publish content without proving who they are. So unless we fix this issue of uh, providing credentials, of uh, permissioning the ledger in a way that's used by the news industry, uh, this will not be solved by a permissionless ledger. Um, there are some things like um, Medium and Brave Browser, I believe, where uh, contributors uh, will be rewarded for, um, for readers. So other readers will give it a like or whatnot, and then that would be, you don't even have to be a known writer, and if your uh, article is useful and enough people like it, it'll wind up at the top. So those kinds of things are starting to happen. And I think there's one called Medium, and there's one called, um, well, the Brave Browser, where they were actually um, rewarding in bat tokens. And I think that was tokenizing news. You might want to look into that. I'll, I'll just add to it, right? So blockchain is another platform, right? So the question goes back to whether it's fake news or even in the cases of supply chain, right? I'm tokenizing a physical asset it creates slightly much better, you know, I would say, trust than what it does right now in the physical world. But even, in, you know, in the case of, you know, the mango use case I was telling you about, you're still getting a physical product at the store. So how do I know, just because the blockchain says, yeah, this mango came from Mexico, it doesn't mean that somebody could not have swapped out that mango from Mexico from, say, a mango from India. I mean, there was no way for me, the end person, to know that what the blockchain says is still true or not true, right? So from a physical perspective, there are some technologies that are coming out of IBM Research. There's something called the crypto verifier. So where, when you take a physical uh, product, whether it's a bottle or you know, oil or whatever, you can actually take a picture. It's a device that plugs into your iPhone. You can take a picture of it. It takes a microscopic image of the physical product and it stores that image onto the blockchain. And when you get the product in the store, you can take a picture and it'll tell you it was the exact same product or not. So that's digitizing a physical asset. So that's, now it won't be applicable for just about every product, but for some high-end startup, right? I mean, we did a study for, you know, uh, olive oil being sold in the US stores. 85% of the olive oil which is sold as EVO are not EVOs. So what you're thinking it's an EVO when you're going to your grocery store and buying it might not be EVO because they are mixed with something else. So, and you find that with you know, high-end lubricants for cars and airplanes and all that. So there are some products for where it thinks like that matters. Fake news, I don't know how you solve it even in the blockchain. So hopefully there's somebody brighter, smarter, and younger than I am who can solve that problem. <laughs> Yeah, let, let's take that as a working example, right? So let's say we're trying to fix the fake news problem in a decentralized manner. So the, the way we used to have uh, real news um, is basically by going to a paper that we trust and we say, okay, I'm reading the, what have you, Wall Street Journal. And they claim these numbers like the Dow Jones are real and we, it's coming from the Wall Street Journal. We trust the Wall Street Journal, so we, we're going to assume these numbers are right. So now we'd say we go to Facebook and Joe Schmo writes an article claiming that the Dow is you know, 2,000 points lower. So how can we trend that Joe Schmo has the truth when in fact you know, the Wall Street Journal is claiming, is claiming otherwise? 
we need to put on a ledger something that will be equivalent to the work that the Wall Street Journal is putting in, in, in creating this, this information and publishing it, meaning that there needs to be a consensus on the ledger that says, okay, Josh Moe says this is the value of the Dow Jones because he went to the exchange, and by the way, he can prove it, and we can see proof on the ledger that he went to the exchange, and he got that number actually published. And at that point, it would be a situation where we have proof on one hand that Josh Moe is telling the truth, and the Wall Street Journal is telling us otherwise. So if we have a mechanism on the ledger that is sh sharing the proof that there is something actually, the background check has been done, that has been vetted by enough participants, then the, the network can trust the information is true. So that's typically what would need to happen. The equivalent of what is happening today behind the scenes of the Wall Street Journal going to the exchange and, and getting that number from the computer, that would need to be proven to the ledger as opposed to assume the information is right. So you need to prove more on, on blockchain than you would in a traditional media. And still it wouldn't prevent... Get left. Let's get a mic here. We just got a couple minutes left here. And yes, I mean, it's like the, the proof of work you were talking about, right? That you're making the effort and you're proving that you made an effort it still won't prevent someone from making that effort and then giving you wrong facts Correct. because of a specific intent that is worth more to them than investing the work which they have. That's so it's still, it still doesn't solve it. But yes, it, it makes it uh, less, uh, less economical for someone to do it or it take, the price is higher. Yeah, as opposed to today, where with a random Twitter account, you can claim anything you want. So I have a question about, you mentioned healthcare, and I'm thinking this might be a really good thing to use for like the World Health Organization, where people opt in and they provide information. Do you know if they're using anything like this? I don't know if the World Health organizations doing it, but I know um, there are conferences, there are clinical trials with research, and um, there's large groups of organizations that are really getting on board with that. And, and then just to add it, I mean, there's a lot of work that IBM is doing in the healthcare space, so there's an active project going on both with the FDA, the Veterans Affairs, the CDC, where you can now store your electronic health records on the blockchain, so every time you go from a doctor to a doctor or a hospital, and then you, the patient, controls your health records at any point in time. Because right now, when you go into a doctor's office, you sign this piece of paper which says, the doctor's office has full authority to give it to anybody else, right? But then, once you walk away, you don't have a control about that, so they can transfer it to whoever, right? So you kind of sign it off. So now you have control over it. The idea is you could have it on your app, and you can at any point in time say, I do not consent to giving my records to anybody else. So you can just say, for the two weeks that I'm visiting my doctor, the doctor can see my health records, and then I go off somewhere else, I can remove the consent, and nobody has access to it. So you always control it. That's the goal of those projects. Are you familiar with Watson? What's that? Are you familiar with Watson? Yes. So are they using that as well? Watson adds on to it. So blockchain and Watson are two different stuff, right? So blockchain is just a ledger. It just stores it and you have consent. But then you can always add something like a Watson or some kind of an AI tool to say, OK, I'm collecting all this data, but what do I do with it, right? That's where those technologies come into play. Yeah. Hi, Bob Vandehey from Alchemy. We are a digital banking firm here. So identity, what you're talking about, is something that's you know very important to us and our customers. That's something we take very seriously. But I'm curious if you know of any any uh, movement going in that area. I know, you looking through my history, you know, as we've gone through the internet, you know, we've started multiple different types of attempts to try and get some type of identity. Starting with kind of like my knowledge is VeriSign used to offer personal certificates to people that you would use. Passport tried to do it. You know, even Google has tried to do it, and nothing has really taken on. And I think it actually contributes to why we have you know, so much fake news, so much just misinformation, why people can be so rude on the internet, all that type of stuff. 
And I think it would be to the greater good to have an identity that everybody had that we could trust. Do you see any movement in that area? There is a project called the Hyperledger Sovereign. It came out of University of Utah. And IBM is now one of the founding members of that. It's just like Fabric and Corda. That's another uh, spin-off. And it it's called Hyperledger Sovereign. It's called a sovereign blockchain. And the whole idea around that is something called, how do I create a self-sovereign? Like, how do I identify yourself that you can carry with you across, you know, wherever you want to go? So that's the whole genesis of that. Now, how it's actually getting implemented, I don't have the details, but that's a project you might want to go look at. Very quickly, uh, from, a <clears throat> from a corporate perspective, um, the, in a financial world, uh, there is a due diligence called KYC, Know Your Customer, which is mandatory, and uh, that we are currently porting on, the, on blockchain. is basically a set of, of, uh, of facts checking and document collection that you need to do before you can um, uh, process anything from your customer. Uh, which does not apply to, to retail customers, uh, to us uh, in the real world. There are, however, some projects uh, that are currently on Corda, uh, made by a company uh, called Gemalto, G-E-M-A-L-T-O, Gemalto. Uh, and they are specialized in, um, in ID documents. I believe in Europe they are being used, they are issuing chips for the, the driver's license, so they are, they, they are specialized in identity management, and they're trying to port some of their real-world knowledge into the blockchain. It's not completed yet, it's in, it's in the works. Okay, and right here in Dallas, there's actually a company called The Learning Machine, and they have a um, blockchain agnostic uh, platform which can issue digital identity and they worked with MIT for um, issuing uh, their graduate diplomas and so that platform can be used for anything so that's something you might want to look into and actually it was started by somebody who's um, their CTOs from Microsoft in the past I think we got one one last question then, okay. Thank you. Um, regarding banking, more specific, residential mortgage lending, uh, what do you see as the any remaining significant hurdles from a regulatory and or overall process in the home purchase loan process or is most of the banking been more on the consumer banking that you've been referring? Well, the, the regulations are already in place today, so blockchain is not going to remove the regulations. What, what, what we can do is make this process really seamless for borrowers and, and lenders to get together to speed up you know, the fact-checking, the collateral management, all that kind of stuff. So I think we can improve the operations. So it's more or less making the, regu inform making the regulators feel more comfortable yes. about the making process. them a party. There Educate. is a mechanism in blockchain, I mean, in, in Corda specifically, where when you execute a transaction, you can make the regulator a part of the signature so that, you know, when there is a borrower and a lender, you can also ask for the regulator to sign the transaction so that they get a say on whether the borrower can, can borrow that money or not. And you can share, there's, there's multiple ways that you can you can sign, you, you can um, either use something called a non-validating notary, which is basically uh, just guaranteeing that the, uh, and I'm not going to drill into the details, but not seeing the content of the transaction, just making sure that the transaction has not been used twice. So that's the double spending uh, thing we're talking about. And there is a, a validating notary, which is able to sign the transaction by looking at it and say, okay, I know that borrower. Uh, the KYC, so the know you customer has been done, so you can get the money. Which is, so we, we can involve the regulator directly at the transaction point as opposed to get reports after the fact. So that could be much more efficient because that would cut down all the paperwork. Wow, Jenna, thanks for putting together a great panel. I wanted to thank all of you for attending this evening and great questions. And thank you, Jenna, for putting together a great panel. And thanks to our panelists. I should. Have a great Thanksgiving, and we'll see you next time.